just let me stop and take a poll. How many people here have had any connection that they know of with the Holocaust? Wow, that might be the biggest proportion of my people that have come to talk, have talked to you so far. Number two, how many of you have relatives, older relatives by definition, who you wish you would have asked more about your family past? <laughs> and now do you think, oh, I could have done something differently, or have you thought about this over time? I think that I think that, that pretty much covers almost everyone, actually, because <laughs> We all want to know about where we came from. Um, so I grew up in a little town in Lima, Ohio, and I have a friend here, Dean Beer, who comes from my same hometown. This audience has everything. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about really where I came from. Um, I just know, and I even tell this tale in the book, that in fifth grade, the teacher asked, you know, right, we're not from this continent, um, you know, do you know your ethnic background? Do you know where your people come from? And basically my whole class just shrugged and I raised my hand and I said, I'm a Polish Jewish descent. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> and in the carpool after school, you know, we repeated this and I repeated that and the, the carpool mom turned around and said, You're, you can't fib. I said, what? She said, yes, everyone knows all Poles are Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and I was scratching my head because I wouldn't make that up. That's not like a thing a kid fibs about. Um, so anyway, years later, when I was a young reporter, um, I had worked at the Cleveland Plain Dealer and gotten to at least have some passing relationship with my father's cousin, who's a Holocaust survivor. And they invited me to their house for Passover. And, you know, we were really not exactly very serious Jews. And, you know, so we're having a Seder and it's going on and on. And I'm like looking at my watch. <laughs> and I'm like, I wish my grandfather was there to flip the pages. <laughs> and all of a sudden, finally, the, the service ends and Sam, my cousin Sam, who was always a very quiet, shadowy guy, he jumps up and he, he pulls all the, the paintings off the wall and he pulls out a slide projector with a disc of slides that made me think, does anybody remember those old slide projectors? And I thought, oh my God, we're gonna be here all night. What is this? And he said, let me show you where you come from. And he starts showing these images of this like, you know, these are commie times in Poland in this like sad gray, expands and he's like this is Kazimierz Wielka and I was like okay <laughs> you know like um, I wasn't so impressed at the time but then he started telling stories about what it was like growing up there and what happened to our family members and I'm like scribbling on cocktail napkins and these these words that I can't possibly imagine spelling much less saying and you know something really happened that night um, but I went back to my reporting and I moved paper to paper. And one day um, I was in Providence, Rhode Island and Ellie Wiesel was speaking. And he said, you have to listen to the survivors. And I was at the Providence Journal then. And so then I called up my cousin Sam and I said, you know, how about an interview? And that led to many, many long sessions over his dining room table in Canton, Ohio. And I wrote a magazine story with a much less able editor, by the way, <laughs> that was sort of what I thought was gonna be, you know, okay, this was my, it was very moving, I, you know, it was very, it changed me in many ways, but I thought I was sort of done with that. Um, anyway, we did have a celebratory meetup and I said, if you ever go back to Poland, I, you know, I'd like to tag along. So I started going to Poland with my cousin in 1991 and my last trip with my cousin was in 2017. Um, and that's a lot of trips to Poland and that's a lot of times he was going back and back and back because no matter what happened to him, and a lot happened to him, 
it was still his home and it's his, you know, I, I don't feel that way about Lima, Ohio. I don't know about you, Dean, but he really still feels a strong connection to his hometown. And in fact, I just came from Poland and they honored him as the last Jew of the town. And these were celebrations that, that, uh, that fortunately, the, the mayor of the town and the school children, they, you know, they put on an amazing extravaganza, if you will. And it was really something. But it also starts to get at sort of the sad story here. There's a civilization that's completely gone. And yet, um, it is part of current politics right now. They're about to have an election in Poland in middle of October. And the history of how the Poles treated the Jews and whether they rescued them or not and all that is a burning issue. Um, and it's, it's amazing. But if you think about what's going on in our country, um, you see that history, the narrative of history is still a very current issue for, for many, many people. Um, but I want to mention how this title came about. By the way, that is my cousin Sam as a toddler. He's two years old. <laughs> and that's my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother on the cover. And I was just at the rededication of the cemetery, the pre-war cemetery where this guy's buried. And they're actually posing in front of the lumber yard. They're so proud of their, the family lumber yard that this was before a wedding and that's where they posed. But the title comes from the fact that Poland was a garden, a, a, a very bountiful garden for Jews for hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, we were in, we were Poles were invited to Poland um, and given civil rights bar, you know, beyond anything anywhere in Europe certainly, in medieval times. And now, except for the 150 years that it, Poland didn't exist, it was a place where my family and many Jews thrived for a very long time. Um, and I always feel like it's really important to say that because our, our view of the history is totally, you know, in the graveyard, in the, in the you know, the, the Holocaust. Um, and also, uh, having just been there, I was moved once again. It was my 10th trip to Poland. My cousin Sam used to say, you know, we're Polish. We go to Poland for vacation. <laughs> um, anyway, and the, the countryside is so beautiful, and especially this time of year. And, and Sue and I went this afternoon to Chanticleer. Yeah. Stunning place. Um, a little more manicured than Poland, but anyway. Um, but you know, it's just, it really is, you know, these, these senses that, that bring us back. Um, and then, well, I'll get to the, the other meaning of the title in a minute, but Poland had the most Jews at the beginning of World War II. I don't know if people know that, but there were 3.3 million Jews. And at the, in 1945, there were 380,000. Um, and the, the part that is not, you're not supposed to say out loud, is that many of the people that were killed in the countryside who were not in ghettos and concentration, concentration camps and so forth were killed at the hands of Poles. And I say this, and this is why I give this whole build up, is like I have real affection for the place and I'm not looking to, to paint all Poles with a broad brush. But that mere fact is not allowed to be spoken in Poland. In fact, it's against the law. When was this law passed? 2018. It is a version of history that has been mandated by the government. The same government that is trying to hold on to power and have an unprecedented third term. So I was a little nervous going to Poland this time because I didn't know, now that my book is out, I'm like, but my story is about what happened to our specific relatives. And 
this is, you know, this is why Avery is saying I was nervous a lot of times. I have to make sure all my facts are right because in fact, this is very, very current third rail stuff. Um, but what we found, we were pursuing this, um, the first time we landed there, driving down from Warsaw and my cousin tells me about this tip that this one cousin survived the killing of her family and she's still alive and we were gonna go find her. Well, I landed in Poland that first time having come from, I was a crime reporter, I was always at really nice scenes. And I'd, <laughs> I'd come from, in Rhode Island, um, this family had been murdered. It was a lawyer, his Brown University librarian wife and their eight-year-old child. Mm. And this story gripped the entire state. Every single beat of the story was just, you know, people were obsessed. It became a national story. And I was working around the clock. And I even did a feature story about how upset the, the police were who found the little girl, you know. And then I land in Poland where there's just, you know, it's like a graveyard um, everywhere. And, and, you know, farmers are still digging up human bones and anyway I don't want to get too macabre but it was really much more appealing to try to find a living person in that context and so I thought well I've got a few skills I might lend to this effort and so we start going to visit my cousins you know people his former schoolmates and people that had done business with his family and we were welcomed with these multi-course meals you know this lady goes and starts making homemade noodles and you know it was just and they're welcoming us you know with hugs and all this warmth but then when the topic of this cousin Henya would come up stared at their plates evasive and I learned that my first phrase in in Polish besides Dzień dobry is was neviem which is I don't know but it was such a reflexive, I don't know, you know, and again, I've covered a lot of crime, spent a lot of time in court at trials, and I was like, that's a little too quick. So I was really hooked on trying to crack this mystery. Um, maybe obsessed, lots of trips, lots of research. And, you know, Sam got really mad at this guy that, you know, after this one of these meals and said, we're not coming back, we're out of here, never gonna talk to you again. And the next day, this guy, you know, it's in, I don't mean to give up the whole book, but the next day we go back and he said, hey, I got something really special to show you. We get in the car, we go to another farm, talk to another, you know, people that look like they don't really wanna see us. And this guy says, Okay, you can come inside. What were we there for? Is this a tip for Henya? What was this about? No, it was to see the dining room table from Sam's childhood. And that seemed like a nice enough thing. But then we're brought in there and they say, to look, not to take. Like, I'm thinking, was I gonna strap a dining room table on my back and... <laughs> wasn't something we really had in mind and then the next thing is the owner of the table started crowing about the great price he got at auction after in the very lumber yard of my family after the jews were removed and i'm thinking does this guy like you know not have any sense of who he's talking to because yes my cousin survived but you know a lot of the people that used to be around that table did not. But I can hear Cousin Sam right now in my head, but that guy gave us good information. Indeed, the, the table man, as we called him, <laughs> Sam said, hey, did you ever hear about this family, the doulas? I hear they hid around here somewhere. And the guy goes, oh yeah, they're buried in the root cellar next door. So this was the kind of like, you know everybody knows everything when they when they give you that quick kind of story. So we go next door and sure enough, this another farmer comes out and we're like, what's this reception gonna be like? 
And he said, this was a tragedy for your family and for mine. And he proceeds to tell about how he had, um, his father had sheltered this entire family, five adults, for 18 months, sneaking soup to this cavern under the barn, and you know, every day keeping them fed, keeping them safe. And then in, in the spring of 44, when the Red Army was advancing and liberation seemed imminent, 50 Polish gunmen descended and killed them all. So I would find out later that this is like the best documented case of, you know, court case of, you know, one of these types of incidents where Polish partisans killed Jews in hiding. But this, the, the, the odyssey to get to that court case is something you'll have to read the book about because it's a very long road. Anyway, this gets at this complexity of the past in this place and how, how complex it was to try to find out just what happened to our relatives. Those, the descendants of that family that hid the doulas are now like our close, con you know, we have a very close connection. We just visited them. And it's the most amazing relationship I've ever had with, with the great grandson of someone who hid relatives of mine who were murdered. Um, but the warmth and the, the purity of that relationship is, is like, amazing. Those people have suffered a lot um, at, in this climate in Poland. The stigma of having hidden Jews is very real and very present for them. Um, and in fact, the granddaughter of the people that hid the Dula family um, she was on hand one day when we came back another time. So I gotta stop and tell you, Steven Spielberg, after he filmed Schindler's List, which became the first successful Holocaust movie ever, very successful at the box office, he wouldn't take a dime. And he created a foundation, some of you probably know about it, the, the Shoah Foundation, and they took oral histories of every Holocaust survivor they could. Cousin Sam gave him a little bit of an interview in Ohio, and then he said, I want to take this on location. So, so we go to Poland, film crew, you know, Polish translator, and it was, it was quite a, a phenomenon. But it's, it's, it's great because we have all this on film, and, and um, so we go back to the same place where we'd first met uh, Mr. Soto. And since I'd already knew the story and everybody was kind of paying attention, I noticed this woman and her eight-year-old son kind of at the fringe of this gathering. And, you know, I'm like, who are they? Well, it turns out they lived there. And the guy who we were talking to didn't. And she's like, why is he talking to the camera? Anyway, this was a bizarre scene. Turns out she never knew that on her very property, there were Jews buried. She did not know that, in fact, her grandfather had harbored Jews for 18 months. And her uncle, who was talking on camera, had never talked to her about it, which was wild. But she said, in school, they always teased me. They taunted me. They called me doula. They said, what about the Jews in the garden? That's how we get Jews in the garden, OK? <laughs> so, um, so that's why it's strange to be in Poland now and find that the government has a new narrative that they're imposing, enforcing on the populace in hopes of being reelected. And that is that all Poles save Jews. Mm -hmm. All Poles are heroes. And, and, you know, they should all be celebrated. And that's why it's weird when you have this experience that I've had to, to hear that, because I wish it were true, because there would be a lot more Jews around. Um, but while I was there, this is very recently, just in the last few weeks, 
um, there was a family, probably none of you have heard, did anyone hear of the beatification of the Alma family? Okay, so the, so this is the this is the story that they are saying proves their narrative. This was a, an, a wonderful family that took in eight Jews and and hid them for you know about the same duration as as the Dulas and the Rosenics, you know the family of Henya, and then a Polish policeman revealed their presence. And Nazis came and killed all the Jews and then killed the Alma family. And which is a tragic, horrible thing that happened. And the Almas were, um, they've been at Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the place in Israel where they honor righteous rescuers of, you know, of Jews. That was in 1995. But right now, this has been brought up for political reasons, and they were just beatified while I was there. Um, a couple and six children and an unborn child. So this is a kind of a controversial point in, the, in Catholicism because the child was, now they say the child was born. <coughs> anyway, um, so that's a side issue. But, but the Almas were, were heroic. And they made paid this ultimate sacrifice, but there were a thousand cardinals in this small town in Poland for this event. That was just literally two weeks ago, and I'm I'm just has anyone heard of this? But that's that's just interesting because it's um it got press, but um, it's really for local consumption and for political reasons. Anyway. Um, Henya's trail proved very difficult to follow because of this, what I call, a conspiracy of silence around the, the killing of Jews in hiding by Poles. And even now, I was trying to get more information on this trip, and I got, it was a long time ago. Oh, don't bother. So, um, I, I just wish that, um, I wish I had met her in time to introduce her to my cousin Sam, who just turned 99 years old. Um, he's still pretty sharp. He's now using a scooter to get around, but <laughs> other than that, he's, he's quite with it. And, um, and I, I really, I really uh, hope that, that, um, oh, I forgot. I was going to read something. Do you mind if I read something? Okay. So the reception that we got was not always as welcoming as at the place where they made the homemade noodles. Um, Sam parked on the road by the farm's entrance. It was a sultry October day. We tromped up the drive stirring dust and trepidations. At the top of the hill, we found a scene that turned on the soundtrack from Deliverance in my head. Rundown buildings surrounded a farmyard littered with empty vodka bottles of varying sizes. The barn slouched as if it too had been on a bender. Even the wooden well house in the middle of the barnyard leaned off kilter. Nobody home, Sam pronounced. Stefan scanned the barnyard as if scoping out an escape route. He's the husband that gave us the original tip of Sam's schoolmate. Sam said, they'll probably come back soon for the, from the fields for lunch. I had a bad feeling about this. Maybe we should wait for them off the property, I suggested, thinking of many door knocks I'd made as a reporter that had not gone well. I half expected to see shotguns emerge. Roosters started making a racket, alerting us to the horse-drawn wagon just cresting the hill. The guy holding the reins had bloodshot eyes under a cap askew. I pegged him as a day drinker. Another guy sat in the wagon with a tiny woman in a babushka. Sam called out a greeting in Polish, apologizing for the unannounced visit and asking for a moment of his time. 
He said he came from Kazimierz Zawielka and was trying to piece together some history. He did not wait for responses, hurrying to put them at ease, particularly the driver who was squinting at us with smoldering eyes. Without hearing a word of English, I read their body language. No signs of anything hospitable. Sam courteously addressed the old woman, frowning at him beneath her sun-bleached babushka. She dismounted, showing torn white stockings under a skirt caked in mud. The other man hopped down from the wagon without a word, deferring to the woman. Sam continued asking for answers about the Rosenics, saying he understood they had hidden in a house nearby and had a surviving daughter. <coughs> Before Sam finished the question, the old woman answered with that reflexive, Nivyem, I don't know. She waved us away like she was swatting flies. Here we were, right near where the Rosenics hid, and yet amnesia abounded. I watched her frown and turn away. She kept repeating, Nivyem, nye. Fat chance she was going to become chatty and cooperative. It was so frustrating. In this place where roosters outnumbered people, surely back fence chatter abounded. Both Mandetsky, that's the guy with the table, and Stefan had told us how much people chewed on old gossip and war stories. But the old woman's shaking head delivered another gut punch to our expectations, another brick wall. I pulled out my camera and started snapping frames. This scene was worth remembering particularly the old woman with the Baba Yaga look. My little instamatic seemed unobtrusive, especially while Sam was talking to the farmers. I was framing shots of the vodka bottles, the well house, the roosters, and the old woman leaning heavily on the horse-drawn cart. Then the wagon driver appeared in the viewfinder. His face darkened like a storm, his cheeks puffed and his mouth puckered. He flamed red. He lunged at me with a pitchfork. I tucked the camera in my pocket and backpedaled. Everyone reacted. The three guys and the old woman all threw their arms trying to restrain the guy. He ranted and reached for me. The old woman who came up to his waist held little sway. She was shouting and poking at him, but she could not even reach his swinging arms. He writhed and jabbed the air, yelling at me. Sam shot me a look. He wants your camera. He wants you to erase the picture of him, Sam said. I know. I'm not giving him the camera, I said. He's upset about the picture, Sam said. Yeah, uh, that's pretty clear, I said. <laughs> <laughs> but did you find out what happened? Was Henya here? They don't know anything like all the rest. Between the wagon drivers, flashing eyes, and that pitchfork, I decided to cut our losses. My Nikes did a 180 and I hightailed it down the driveway. The camera would be safer in the car and so would I. I closed the door, but didn't lock it. It's a good thing. A few minutes later, Sam jogged down the driveway. He hopped in and fired up the engine. Somehow Stefan, moving awfully fast for a big man, managed to get to the car, plopping in the back seat. We sped off, kicking up a cloud of dust. Now I second-guessed myself. Had I ruined our chances? <laughs> Spam. <laughs> <laughs> Had I ruined our chances? Boop, boop, boop. Had I ruined our chances of getting information? I had been a benign presence on this trip until now. I might be slowing Sam's progress by always asking him to translate. Maybe they saw him as a pole, and he could have charmed these folks. Maybe I put them off, a young American in a jewel-toned Gore-Tex shell, staring suspiciously. We drove in silence. I'm sorry, Sam. I couldn't give my camera to that guy. I hope I didn't ruin everything. Sam didn't say anything until we dropped off Stefan. When we reached the hotel, I started to get out. He said, well, young lady, I froze. Today it is very clear, he continued. What's that, I asked. I saw the stubborn look on your face when I asked you for the camera. There was no way you were gonna give it. And I thought, 
Today I know you are a Rakowski. <laughs> so, questions? The Poles that sheltered your family, why were they killed? Well, this gets into a touchy subject that about the numbers that they say of Poles who were actually killed for hiding Jews. And I was just at this in Poland and at a lecture being given about the Alma family by a priest who said, how many people do you think, how many Poles do you think were killed um, for harboring Jews? People said, tens of thousands. This was a priest speaking, a professor. And he said, nope. Another, another guess, thousands. Nope. He said, we have to deal in facts. The facts that we have, with a great deal of research, are 600 to 800. Um, and so I just share that with you because the, the, it was, it was an incredibly intimidating, um, you know, the Nazis told everyone they were gonna be killed if they did that. So it's, it's, it's not like, well, you can't just say, well, they weren't, so it wasn't scary. No, I'm not saying that at all. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying. And the, um, and the fact that you could be betrayed, somebody, and that's how many of them, you know, someone told that they were hiding them and that's what happened. But it's, um, the terror was, you know, tremendous. But in fact, there were not as many as the perception is. What was the basis for the um, partisans killing the Jews? Like, what did they articulate as the reasons for doing that? So, again, this is where we get into my fact hoarding. Um, there, okay, so there was a big umbrella of the Armia Craiova, and there were all these different partisan groups. The partisans did amazing, wonderful, you know, a lot of really important stuff, in intelligence for the allies, um, but it was an umbrella group, and there were some bands of, you know, battalions under it that some of them were openly, the Andetsia were openly supportive of what the Nazis were trying to do, and then there were some, you know, bad guys in, you know, the one that told us about what happened to the Rosenics. He was the commander of a battalion. He wasn't there and he didn't do it, but he told us what happened to people that he knew that participated. So there were bad actors and then there were some whole groups that were going around killing Jews because they did not want them to come back and take their homes, businesses and property back. Um, and that's all really well proven now, but it's still not something you could say in Poland. <laughs> I was talking to somebody, like the Germans basically threw their country away. What were the Jews doing that aggravated them so much that they just, they ruined their whole country? What could they possibly have been doing that would cause that mass of people to do what they did? What, what was it? I'm not sure I can explain anti-Semitism in five, word, five minutes or less, but... but... You're talking about throwing your country. Well, well, they thought it should be their country. I mean, they had an expansionist, if you want to talk about the military. <laughs> it almost did. <laughs> well, so there... The, the, um... There was a lot of, um perception, you know, in a lot of places where people are targeted for genocide, they are the middlemen. And the Jews were the ones collecting rents. They were put between the, you know, the aristocracy or the, the, the big owners of things. And they were the ones that were going around and collecting the rents, building up resentment of, of the, the peasant class that didn't like them because they were coming around asking for the money. And also, um, People might not know that Jews were actually very restricted in the in the uh, professions they could practice, and they were restricted to like 
the money lending and so forth. And then that gives rise to a lot of stereotypes that you may be familiar with. Um, but I don't think it's very easy to rationalize on any level what happened. Um, well, I have to stop and say that there was, we have to look at, at how things get so bad because there was a nationwide survey of Gen Z and millennials that showed that while they have some more, more knowledge of what the Holocaust, you know, what, of who was who and they know who Hitler was, 59% um, nationally think that it could happen again. So that's America, that's pretty recent, and that's, I think, something to be concerned about. Did writing this book change you personally? I don't know, Sue, you knew me before. <laughs> yes, ab absolutely, absolutely. But I also think that um, one of the most important things to do is to go, I didn't just read a bunch of books here and then write this. You know, I went to the place where it happened and talked to people and have friendships and, you know, I see more grays than perhaps I would have if I just read a lot of shocking information. Um, because it is a personal story, but it's also, you know, obviously by this discussion, you could see that it's obviously, you know, touches a lot of emotions for all, all of us. Um, but I think that one of the reasons why ancestry, my heritage, one of the biggest things that's going on in this country, and I think the hope, uh, you know, the, to, to, to draw from in this polarized time is that people are really curious about where they come from and who they are and what, what happened to the people before them. And, you know, some of these DNA things that come back and you find that you're not who you thought you were. <laughs> I think it's kind of the real way to melt the pot in a good way. Um, because you can't really look at people as, oh, you're just that and that, you know. Um, so that, that I, I, it's really funny because I, I kept thinking, oh, this is my last trip. Oh, this is my last research. This is my last. But now... There are people in Poland, the great-granddaughter of the people who hid my cousin Sam, who she's like, when are you coming back? Will you stay with us? You know, so it's like, whoa, this is just, it's not just like, this is the story and I'm telling the story, right? So it's it's very moving. And, um, you know, the but the, the thing is, I am so fortunate, I'm so lucky that I got to travel with my cousin, who lived through this experience, not only to hear him tell the story here, but to you know be on the ground, watch him interact, and and I think that is really rare. And we are really on the cusp of losing the last you know the eyewitnesses. And I did see you know a tweet. The Holocaust Museum puts out tweets from Ellie Wiesel. And it was a reminder of what he said about, you know, a long time ago. They said, well, what's going to happen when there are no more survivors? And he said, the witnesses to the witnesses will be our, our resource. So I'm a witness to the witness. And he's still on my FaceTime every other day. <laughs> but I don't know how much longer. So I, I feel very fortunate. And that's why I wanted to share that with you. We've got to have hope. <laughs> That's, if my cousin Sam can have hope, yes. then I think we can all have hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.